Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we have what the, the long anticipated Caracal 816A2. Now I have to say that I test maybe three guns a week. I'll, I'll do I'll do reviews on, and I have to say there hasn't really been anything in quite a few years that I've been as excited as I am about this rifle. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for it. But uh, first, I want to give you a little bit of background with it. Uh, Caracal is a company uh, out of Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Very unique company. Uh, they began around the 2004 time period. Now, that region of the world is not what you would call industrial, to say the least. Um, also, throughout that region of the world, there's only one gun manufacturer, uh, really, in the, in the entire region, which is in Israel. The Arab countries do not have any manufacturing capabilities, uh, unlike the United States, where, for instance, you know, you have, say, Colt. Uh, you have Colt as the manufacturer, but they will have surrounding them several job shops, machine shops, uh, people who can handle chrome plating, people who can handle... Say we want manufacturing polymer components, uh, people who do heat treating, uh, small assemblies and whatnot. It's not all done in one manufacturing facility. It's all spread out through several shops, you know, throughout the, you know, the, the area. Where in the UAE, you don't have that. Also, the UAE wanted to have a little bit of independence from uh, probably Western manufacturers uh, to have a little bit of uh, autonomy for as far as small arms development and uh, being able to supply uh, their country, which also would make sense for the rest of the Arab world. Because, you know, when you deal with the United States, for instance, it's a nightmare because you have ITAR. You know, uh, ITAR is a complete nightmare in many reasons uh, for a lot of these countries because you have to have congressional approval for you to be able to sell firearms. Well, what happens is, is and, and has happened, uh, I had this happen when I worked at Colt, we had got the license to sell a particular country firearms. When you sell them firearms, you can go over and train them on Anything that's in the operator's manual, uh, you know, you know, weapons maintenance, like, like cleaning, uh, disassembly, just just the basic what a soldier would do. However, you require a separate license for uh, armor work. We had applied for the license to go for armor work, and at that time they were not on the State Department's good list, so we couldn't. So uh, also, when you buy components from the United States, it's the same thing. You have to have end user certificates, which restricts where you can send any parts that are made in the U.S. Also, what that would do is if you had an Arab brother who was manufacturing these uh, these weapons, you eliminate that. You can, If somebody has an issue, you can be there the next day rather than have to wait for a uh, license from, from the U.S. Congress so you can go over and take care of it. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Well, Caracal was a part of a, of a conglomerate called uh, Tawazun. I believe it's Tawazun. I always get that, that name mixed up. Uh, which is a very large industrial complex. Caracal's first product was a pistol, uh, the the C4, uh, which was a 18 shot pistol. It, was, it had a lot of similarities to the Glock 17. Uh, one of the things about the Caracal pistol that was really really different from from even Glock was the the, the bore axis was even lower, uh, which had less felt recoil than even the Glock pistol did. They had decided they wanted to get into small arms development, uh, for as far as rifles were concerned. Now. What really makes this rifle special, other than just the manufacturers, who actually designed it? It was designed by two engineers uh, who are some of the most prolific uh, in the last part of this uh, century, for as far as I'm concerned, or the first part of this century. The first manufacturer was a German engineer. Uh, this German engineer, he was just to remain nameless. Um, this gentleman worked for H&K. He was one of, the, one of the top guys on the HK416 project. So he had a lot of development work into that. Well, he was hired then by SIG. And at SIG, he teamed up with a gentleman named Chris Royce. Two, he was, Chris Royce is probably one of the more prominent in, in the industry at the time as well, and still is to this day. And they were asked by SIG to make a better rifle than the HK416. Now, the HK416 did have its problems. So the development of the SIG 516 was a next generation or an improvement over the HK416, which very few people know that. Uh, they don't know that the the 516 was part of an evolution. Many people don't realize that the the, the 416 and the 516 and the Caracal are very much intertwined due to the p people who designed them. The 516 was an improvement over the HK416 in the areas, mostly of the gas system was simplified and the uh, reduced the chance of stoppages. There were some some issues because the you know the HK was a very over gas system, so. The 516 is the next iteration of the uh, HK416. Well, those two gentlemen also would go on to design the the SIG 716, 762 millimeter rifle, the MPX, and the MCX. Well, as Caracal came online, Caracal was able to hire both of these gentlemen uh, to come to work for Caracal in the UAE. 
where that was a different situation because it wasn't only they wanted them to build, I want you to build a better rifle than the SIG 516 and the HK416. Uh, we also have to design our own manufacturing facility. As we previously stated, there's no industrialization really in, in that part of the world, so you, you don't have those job shops or those machine shops. So not only do these gentlemen have to design the rifle, but they also had to design a complex uh, within the UAE to be able to manufacture 100% in the UAE. And that was the big deal, 100% manufactured UAE rifle. Um, I've been to Caracal and Abu Dhabi several times, and I have to say I'm very, very, very impressed. When you would go in there, you would have everything. You would have CNC cells. You would have a hammer forge machine for making hammer forge barrels, anodizing, heat treat, uh, every single process uh, that you would have, all those parts are made in-house. Quality control, engineering departments. Um, you had everything that was brought under one roof. Well, there are several roofs in the exact same complex next to each other which was really a big deal, which gave them total autonomy. Uh, and they also had brought in talent from all over the world, uh, U.S., uh, Germany, uh, India, uh, just, to, just to name a few, that there were people who arrived from all over the world to bring in engineering staff, technical staff, the whole thing to make not only a rifle, but to be able to manufacture everything in the house. So the, like when Caracal designed the 816, uh, which you see here, they designed it as a, as a battle rifle that was designed for combat use. It was not designed as a sporting rifle by no means. Uh, this is not a generic rifle. This is actually a combat rifle. They took the basic, basic premises of the M16, and unlike the, uh, the HK416, they stuck with many you know, lower receiver components being that of the M16 or AR15. Now, the upper receiver, the gas system was redesigned, as well as the barrel and, and so forth. There were everything was what you would call very much tweaked to improve it from the the 516. And for as far as the uh, 516 was concerned, they were improving gas system reliability, uh, reducing stoppages, and also because this rifle was meant to be used in the Middle East, particular emphasis was placed on uh, durability in a desert environment. So we're going to go over this thing a little bit here. Now there are some changes between this rifle and the UAE rifle. But I want to give you a little bit of an example of just what this durability is like on the 816. When I was there, uh, an engineer said he would be happy to do a durability uh, demonstration for me, which I was certainly grateful for. So he took one of their production rifles, took it outside, and right outside that door was a humongous pile of horrid Middle East sand. That tiny sand that's like talcum powder that gets into everything. He took the rifle and he buried it in this sand with the injection port cover closed and buried it, pulled it out, walked back into the range, and fired 10 shots on semi and 20 on full auto without a single stoppage. From there, he went over to a bucket of water, washed the rifle off with a bucket of water, and then grabbed the uh, you know, air compressor hose, dried it off with the air compressor, no lubrication, put it back together, went back outside. But this time, he got down into a very violent low crawl. And I felt absolutely horrible for this guy because of the fact that I knew that sand was boiling hot in that 120 degree sun. He did a very violent low crawl that totally covered the rifle in sand. And then he buried the rifle again, except this time he had the ejection port cover open. So he then picked the rifle up, he knocked, knocked it on his side and fired 10 shots on, uh, on semi and another 20 shots on full auto. And it, it functioned perfectly. Uh, not one issue whatsoever. And then me and my uh, buddy who were there, we proceeded, I think we had like four to six magazines, eight magazines. We continued to fire the rifle uh, in the range. That test would have stopped most any rifle I've ever seen. It, it, was, it, it, was, it was an extremely brutal test. This rifle has exceeded all NATO specifications, all NATO, all NATO standards for reliability and durability, uh, which is what makes this rifle very different from anything else you're going to see in the commercial market. And most of the rifles that are in the U.S. market with the exception of companies such as Colt, uh, LMT, uh, when it comes in SIG, pretty much everything else is a commercial-based rifle. They don't ever see the actual military trials or military-type testing, uh, which is something that totally separates uh, this rifle from most of what you see that's out there. So after this, this, this rifle was starting to put in, it was put into production uh, for the UAE and, and several other Arab customers. The decision was made that we were, they wanted to make this into a 
an American gun. They wanted to open up a, a USA manufacturing facility and enter the American market. And as you know, the American market is very much saturated. Well, uh, however, it's not saturated with what you would call high-quality military-grade rifles. You know, there's only a handful of rifles out there in this industry, in the AR platform, which are military-grade. Uh, a vast majority of them are ones that uh, you want to go out and you want to target shoot with. You want to go out empty beer cans and shoot the cans or uh, or so forth. You, you can go ahead and do that. But for as far as a rifle that you're willing to trust with your life, that number drastically goes down, possibly on the one hand, uh, which is one of the areas where this rifle steps in, um, along with Colt, LMT, uh, with you know Knights Armament companies who manufacture guns to military uh, specifications. So to bring this gun to the U.S., uh, Caracal sent back Chris Soroyce, making him operations manager, and had Jeff Spalding as the head of the you know the marketing and sales end of Caracal USA. At Shot Show 2017, a agreement was signed uh, between Wilcox Industries and Caracal that they would work together to build this rifle here in the U.S. Uh, the rifles are now built in Newington, New Hampshire. So it took about a year uh, to get this rifle up and going in the U.S. to make it 100% U.S. made, which means that this rifle is 100% U.S. made, but this is not a whole bunch of surplus parts put together. All the parts on this rifle, as you see, are manufactured per, per the technical data of Caracal, UAE. So it took about a year, and you know, once I shot this rifle, I was hooked. I, I was drastically impressed with it, and I was on Chris Royce. You know, every month or two, finding out where he was on on the you know getting this produced because I was really anxious. You know, I fired probably 500 rounds of it over in the UAE, uh, but I was anxious to get it back here where I could do accuracy accuracy testing and you know various ammunitions and so forth. And I finally got the got the call in December of 2017. It, it's ready, but I had to wait until after Shot Show. Going to Shot Show, uh, I was able to go there. They were at the range day, many days. People were able to shoot them uh, as they were in 2018, 2017 Shot Show as well. And when I got home, the rifle was here, and what you see is right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over this rifle from back to front and, and, and exactly explain to you what's going on here. The stock is an STR stock, uh, Magpul, which is an excellent stock. The ones in the UAE also were using Magpul furniture. The receiver extension is a standard mil-spec uh, six position. Lower receiver is completely uh, unique for as far as its uh, sculpture and whatnot. However, you could drop a standard M4 or any M16 upper receiver onto here. The pistol grip, as you can see, is uh, is a custom. It's uh, manufactured by Caracal. Again, in UAE, everything was to be manufactured in-house. And in UAE, they have molding capabilities to manufacture polymer parts. You do have an end plate, which allows you to use an HK-style hook. You see, you'd have a good place to put your finger here for as far as uh, keeping your finger off the trigger. Now, the trigger mechanism you have in here is a standard mil-spec trigger. It's a standard uh, military-grade trigger. Of course, these are available in the U.S. Uh, for military and law enforcement and selective fire. Uh, however, this one here, for commercial purposes, obviously, is uh, semi-automatic only. Both the uppers and lowers are manufactured of 7075 T6 aircraft-grade um, aluminum forgings. Standard uh, type charging handle. 1913 rail on the top. Uh, we're going to go over the outside and the barrel, and then we're going to go into the inside. We also have a, a Caracal manufactured free-floating handguard, uh, which is M-Lock. Now, the rifles manufactured in the UAE were mill standard 1913 quad rails. And when I first saw this rifle, I was sort of disappointed because, as you guys know, I'm not with the majority of the population in the fact that I like mill standard 1913 rails. So I had asked Chris Soroyce, uh, you know, why'd you guys decide to go with MLOC instead of going with the quad 1913 rails like you did in UAE? And he said, you know, from all their all their research and everything that they did, the direction of the uh, industry is going into MLOC. So they wanted to give the customers right out of the bat what they wanted. Granted, it wasn't me, you know, granted, I'm, I'm probably uh, far behind times and in, in what I like, but that goes without saying. So the biggest thing that I, I noticed was different was the barrel, because the barrels of the rifles that were utilized in the, U, in the UAE were all coal hammer forged barrels so uh, i contacted chris and i said you know what's the deal here why don't you go with coal hammer forge he goes they looked at it you know they knew they weren't going to go with a standard mill spec you know chrome plated barrel uh, they you know they knew that the, both the qpq and the coal hammer forge were superior to that but when they did a close comparison between the qpq and the coal hammer forge barrel they found no benefits uh, of the hammer forged over the qpq i asked about the life expectancy between the two he said that both of them are between twelve thousand and fifteen thousand rounds uh, depending on how it's uh, it's cared for. 
Uh, and he said they found the QPQ was more corrosion resistant than going with the chrome plating. And he, and they felt that the QPQ all around was a better, was a better option than the cold hammer forged. And again, I, I want to state there was no cost cutting here issue. It was, it came right down to the fact that when they tested them side by side, that they felt that there was no, there was no benefit. So those were the two major differences between the UAE gun and the, and this gun was the barrel and the handguard. UAE guns had quad 1913 rail. The uh, USA guns had the Memlock, and they had QPQ instead of the UAE's uh, hammer forged barrels. When you look at the handguard, you also see you have some uh, quick detach points on the on the front. You do have uh, on three, six, nine o'clock ability to install your uh, your Memlock rails. You do have two backup sights, uh, which they're purchased from another company, but these are the ones that go on it. But you will also see on the back here that you have a notch cut into here so you can have the sight in the down position so the aperture will allow the, will allow the fold when it's engaged. So now the upper receiver is proprietary to Caracal because of the way the handguard interlocks in place. So the handguard and the upper receiver are not compatible with the standard uh, mill spec. So the upper receiver has many, many, many differences. The lower receiver Again, is compatible with any US or any M4 mil spec upper receiver. The rifle does come with a Lancer magazine. Now, a lot of the magazines I saw in the UAE uh, were P mags, but uh, I, I believe those have been changed to a foreign made manufacturer again to get, get away from ITAR. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go in a little bit closer and take a look at some of the inside. Now, some of the differences are if you were to look at the HK416, this is one of the major improvements was the cyclic rate. The cyclic rate of fire on the HK416 was out of whack. It is extremely high. You're looking nearly a thousand rounds a minute. Due to the way the gas system was reworked on here to correct that, this was around seven, eight hundred rounds a minute. The way the uh, way this this cycles, it can get probably up to nine hundred uh, with a lot of of uh, erosion in here. But your cyclic rate is much lower. Therefore, you don't need a firing pin safety on the bolt carrier. So it brought it down, made it, the gas system more efficient. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop the upper and lower receiver. What you're going to see in here is a spring-loaded pin. What that does is it applies pressure on the upper receiver to make sure that it's always a tight fit. Now the trigger, this is not the original trigger. I put a Geisley trigger in here uh, just because I wanted to see how this thing would shoot um, you know, for accuracy. So this is not the trigger that comes with it, but uh, a Geisley trigger is always an enhancement over anything. But as you can see, um, you do have a standard selector. You can put whatever you want on it. This will take any upgrades for as far as uh, enhanced safeties, magazine releases, as well as uh, bolt catches. You can put an, a, you know, a Norgan Ambi catch on here, which I probably will do. Looking at a close lookup of the pistol grip, you can also see we have a compartment in the bottom here. But another major improvement on here is the buffer itself. If you notice when I shake this buffer, you don't hear anything. This does not have the conventional slugs of, uh, of the AR-15 M16 where you would have either a, 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 a tungsten slug or a, a steel slug. This is actually using a specific kind of tungsten powder, which performs much better for as far as bolt carrier bounce and, and making the buffer heavier. This has got the weight of an H3, but it has the tungsten powder. This makes a very big difference regarding uh, the cyclic rate as well as uh, increased dwell time as well as bolt carrier bounce. So this is a major enhancement. Now looking on the front, you will see we have an adjustable gas system. We have three positions. We have a standard position for normal use. The second one is for um, adverse conditions, which allows more gas in. That's also used when you have uh, underpowered ammunition. For instance, if you were to use Wolf in this thing, which uh, does not conform to 556 five, specs, you would adjust it to there. It would, it would allow you to use uh, ammunition with less power. However, if it was adverse conditions using full powered ammunition, it increases the gas pressure by about 10% to help work the action better. Then the third position is for uh, use with su a suppressor. And the way this is adjusted is you push in a plunger and you adjust. So obviously when this thing is uh, all it's all caked up with carbon, you can stick a projectile tip in here in the front and use that for leverage for you to be able to adjust it. To remove, we pull all the way out. And now what we have exposed is the gas system. You can see that there's three holes on there. You can see the uh, standard hole. 
and you pop over here for your hole that's slightly larger, and then over here for the one that's slightly smaller. You will notice that we have gas rings on here. What the gas ring does on the piston is, is it seals up the chamber. What this permits you to do is to use less gas than you would like with an AK. So you don't have to over gas the system. So you can, you can run it effectively with lower amount of gas. You see we have a stainless steel rod, we have a return spring, and we have the spacer. Look at the bolt carrier itself. You can see we have a proprietary, it's a, it's a one piece. And it's also lighter. It's a, it's a more lightweight bolt carrier. It does utilize a standard M16 M4 type bolt, but you can see how it's 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 all much lighter. This is a standard M16 carrier. Now to deal with carrier bounce, you will see how this has got some taper to it right here. So what that does is it takes up more room in the receiver extension, so it does not doesn't rattle, so it doesn't give it the opportunity for it to uh, to, to have any kind of carrier tilt in there. You can see upper receiver is standard. One of the things I also want to show you is you're not going to be able to see it here, but you're going to see a picture of it is right inside the chamber here. This gun was designed to be much safer than any other type of rifle out there in the market. Uh, the same system is used by, I do believe, SIG and HK. But what it has right in the receiver extension, there is a large post. And what that post does is when the bolt goes into the lock position, that post sits over the, the extractor. So if there is to be a catastrophic failure with the rifle, the extractor would be fully supported, so the bolt would, sit, would would remain in the lock position. So any pressure would have to go out the barrel. It would never be able to come back into the receiver and have a kaboom where you're going to blow the uh, back of the receiver or have anything back into the receiver. Major safety enhancement. This also works very well for as far as increasing the rifle's durability when uh, using over the beach conditions. That is a military feature that you will not find on anything uh, in this country. Um, so it was designed to be that much more durable and that much more reliable. Now the optic I chose on here was the Trijicon VCOG. I have to say, you know, I've been testing a lot of optics. I've been using SIG optics, Leupold, you know, I have, I have most of the major optics here right now. And the VCOG I absolutely love. Uh, when you have it on the one power, you have a crystal clear, uh, reticle that you can pull right up and you are right there. Uh, you don't have to move your head to try to get the focus in the inside the scope. Then we can adjust from one and a half to two to three to four to five to six. We also have uh, an adjustment so for low level light, we have a, a lit reticle. Um, this 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 scope is ju is just awesome. When you get it up at six power, uh, we're you know you know, we're we're at, we're awesome with it. So for re reassembly, you just slide the the valve right over the the piston. You just rotate that all the way over. And in the upward position, the, the middle position is going to be your uh, normal. To the to my right is going to be your uh, suppressed or your uh, you know, use of lower powered ammunition. To my left will be your position for adverse conditions where you need to, to allow 10% more gas in there. Now, there's no point in assembling the bolt because the bolt carrier group is uh, it's standard M16 for as far as the bolt and the firing pin are concerned. So we are back together. Now, since I've had this for the last few weeks, uh, we're well over 2,000 rounds. Uh, I've shot it in several different conditions. Um, first condition was, uh, you know, was my regular range session uh, where I had about 500 rounds. Uh, the second and third were also that same range, uh, doing shooting with different uh, types of ammunition. And then the uh, last condition, I was out at a very, very long range, and I was able to put this on lab radar. And I was able to get velocities uh, with uh, SIG 77 grain OTM ammunition. And the SIG ammunition is the one I've been using for some of the longer range stuff. And at that same range, I was pinging steel at three and 400 yards with this rifle and this optic 100% of the time. Uh, accuracy was definitely there. I am very, very impressed with this rifle for what it does. Uh, I think this is an ideal, if, you, if you're looking at an external piston version of the uh, AR-15, I think mean, this is definitely one of the top ones out there. Uh, you do have the compatibility, which you don't have with the HK416. You also don't have the humongous price tag of the HK416. This retails for around $1,800 uh, in that area right there. Now, there's also a couple other versions of a well as well. Um, Caracal does manufacture a uh, Model 814, which is a DI rifle, 
which basically is the same as you see here, but with a DI upper receiver. They have a competition model as well. At the same time we're releasing this video, if you also go to our blog on our website, www.smallarmsolutions.com, you will see a very uh, long written uh, blog on this rifle that shows you a lot of the details and it shows a lot of good pictures of the areas where we were at and what we've done. Um, I have a lot of experience with this rifle from its inception. Uh, going back to UAE, and you're going to see some some really good pictures and uh, some good details on the different models as well. So I would encourage you to go there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to a couple different ranges, and we're going to see how this rifle shoots. As I previously stated, you know, uh, somebody who shoots as many guns as I do and tests as much as I do on a weekly basis, it it really takes a lot to impress me. Um, in fact, it doesn't happen too often. You know, I, I see a lot of you know, you know, good stuff, but something that's really um, that much off the wall, that's that much better, not too often. And the Caracal rifle, in my opinion, is an excellent rifle that uh, I think once you really have to understand not only the manufacturer, but who designed it, that's really what I think is most important about this is that there is a lineage that goes from the HK416 to the SIG 516 to the Caracal 816. The same guys who designed all, who designed the previous two, designed this. And this was the accumulation of lessons learned from those two projects to make a better rifle. And uh, that's really what makes this thing so special. Uh, and also just what I saw it do in the UAE for as far as durability and reliability. Now the guns just became available uh, in February. Uh, so they are currently available. Uh, it's still They're still in their infancy for as far as uh, their distribution. So if you guys are interested in purchasing these, uh, you can have your dealers contact Caracal directly. And then I imagine sometime later on uh, this year, they'll be set up through distribution. So they'll be available uh, through distribution channels. But uh, right now, um, if you guys are interested in these, you can go directly to uh, Caracal from your dealer and get pricing and get them that way. There will be a follow-up video on this. Uh, it's going to be on the Caracal 814, the, the direct gas rifle. Now, the direct gas rifle, uh, I don't have nearly as much experience with uh, because this is the cream of the crop. This is the crown jewel of the Caracal lineup right here, uh, especially because it's because this rifle is designed to work in the desert. Uh, that's the primary uh, function of this rifle is a, is a desert rifle for, uh, for Middle East um, Defense Forces. So um, I hope you guys give this rifle a chance, get a chance to shoot one. I think you'll be as impressed as I am. 
So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share and check out the vlog. Thank you.